Okay, well, um, good evening, everybody. You are very welcome uh, this evening here to the Department of Psychology. My name is Mary Hathaway, and I am one of the co-directors for our Centre for Neurodiversity and Development. And I'm also the programme director for both our MSc Developmental Psychopathology and our MA Research Methods uh, Master's programmes. So it's with both hats on that I extend a very warm welcome to everybody, both in the physical room here in L50 in the Department of Psychology, and also in our virtual room, because this is a, is a hybrid event and we're broadcasting live. Uh, lots of uh, people, past students, uh, past staff, and, 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 and lots of people um, around the world, actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, for the event this evening. So that's, that's really wonderful. Um, it's particularly wonderful to see um, so many past and current master's students joining us this evening. And we also have um, indeed past and current staff who've been uh, involved in delivering the master's programmes down through this last 20 years. So a very warm uh, welcome. It's, it's really fantastic that you've all been able to join us here this evening. Um, before I speak to the main event, as it were, and the celebration event, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about the Centre for Neurodiversity and Development itself. Because not only is it the 20th anniversary of the founding of our master's programmes, it's actually also the fifth anniversary of the launch of the centre. Uh, Debbie and I, um, Debbie Ryby, my fellow co-director, launched the centre in 2017. And uh, since that time, we've been working towards um, this vision of bringing people together who are interested in working on neurodiversity, bringing academics, researchers, clinicians, educators, UK charities, uh, other non-academic partners, but most importantly, neurodevelopmental people in the neurodevelopment, the, the neurodivergent community uh, to work on, on research on, on neurodiversity. And we look at you know, a whole range of, of different key questions about cognition, about behaviour, about education, uh, about mental health. And we really work, you know, a core part of, of what we try to do is to achieve positive impact from the research that we do. And um, the ultimate aim of which is to improve the lives of neurodivergent people and their families. It's been really fantastic over the last five years that we've been able to grow the sort of core academic uh, team um, as part of the centre. So, for example, uh, with the addition of Ben Alderson Day, with Karen McLennan, who joined us in September, and we're excited to welcome Emily Mason, who's going to join us uh, from John Hopkins University. She'll be joining us in uh, January. But especially important that we grow and expand the of PGR through the stock of the interagent system. All of them are really and to are absolutely the lifeblood of, of what we do. It's not just been about sort of from the point of view of psychology. We've worked really hard over the last five years to grow our interdisciplinary links with colleagues throughout the institution. So from um, sports science, education, anthropology, medical <laughs> humanities, sociology and computer science. And so really sort of um, getting that critical mass of people interested in neurodiversity, but importantly, working across disciplinary boundaries. And actually, today we held the first event as part of our IAS funded project, which is about developing our interdisciplinary priorities for an inclusive neurodiversity. First event today, we had a fantastic talk from Amy Pearson uh, from Cambridge University, who talked to us about understanding autistic self and, and sociali so sociality. And then we had a really uh, wonderful discussion with colleagues, again, from all of those departments I, I just mentioned, some really challenging and, and stimulating debates and, and questions. And the aim here is really to um, establish our priorities for interdisciplinary research and to be in the best position possible for, for future funding bids and, and to really advance the interdisciplinary work that we're doing in Durham on neurodiversity. A core part of what we do, as I mentioned before, is about um, making sure that our research has positive impact uh, for the people for whom it's most relevant. And this year saw the launch of our AAA training program for teachers. So this is a, a support package, an evidence-based support package uh, designed to change understanding 
of difficulties with attention, sensory arousal and anxiety that we know many autistic and neurodivergent pupils have in this <laughs> And this was very much an effort um, uh, sort of uh, that involved working with non-academic partners. The, the research for this project um, began with collaborations with our partners in the Northeast Autism Society. And the impact for the project um, was realised via collaborations with the SEND Inclusion Service from Durham County Council. And it's been really wonderful to see the reaction that we've had uh, so far to uh, this programme of work. Um, and uh, the early evidence suggests that, uh, you know, the, the impact uh, we're seeing from this AAA programme is, is, is really positive for neurodivergent pupils in school. So looking ahead to the future for the centre, and in particular uh, to the next five years, our aim here is really to do more with participatory research methods, to embed these research methods in, in the work that we are doing. And a central aim here is to establish a participatory panel of experts by experience uh, of neurodivergent people, particularly young people, to really help shape the research that we're doing from the ground up. Um, working with neurodivergent people in this way is something that we do already on many of our projects, but the aim here and, and the vision for the future is really about investing more firmly in all of the work um, that takes place as part of the centre. One way we're doing this is trying to reach out to the neurodivergent community um, and to engage people in research in this way who may not ordinarily um, know about or want to take part in, in research in this way. Um, and we've just finished a, a Research England funded project um, trying to work towards that aim. And I'm just going to share with you a brief video to just give you a sense of the way in which we are trying to do this. So it is a set of neurodivergent So the aim is really just about diversifying our methods and diversifying the ways in which we try to engage people in the work that we do and, and really try to kind of shape our research priorities and shape the work that we do, um, especially with the input of, of neurodivergent uh, where does the master's fit in to all of this? Well, actually, our master's programmes have been absolutely central and crucial to the work of the centre. By having these master's programmes, it has enabled us to generate critical mass in this area. And it's really been um, a, a catalyst in terms of capacity. Uh, for, for example, finding really excellent and attracting really excellent PhD students to come and work with us. But the work that we've done with our master's students uh, in itself has been a really important part of, of developing our research capacity. And I think the best way to exemplify that is just really to highlight a, a selection of, of papers that we've published with our master's students from work done as part of their master's dissertations along the way. Um, I think these, this sort of speaks both to the quality of the work that we do with our master's students, but also the central role uh, that these students have played in, in developing the work that we do uh, in the area of, of neurodiversity. And I, I don't think the centre would be here um, without these master's programmes. 
we're really proud of these programs and um, we're really proud of the fact that in the last 20 years we think we have produced about 450 graduates from these programs and these are graduates who've gone on to do really exceptional things in their careers, uh, in, in clinical psychology, in educational psychology, in their own careers in, in academia and in research. And a really wonderful part of, of marking the 20th anniversary of the programmes has been the opportunity to reconnect with our past students. They've been sharing uh, wonderful memories and, and testimonials with us, and we've collated those into um, uh, a little uh, slideshow that I played at the beginning and, and we'll play again at the end. But it's just wonderful to, to, to have had that opportunity to connect with our students again. In recognising the achievements of our students, it's really important to recognise the, the, the department and the support that the department has given to these programmes, Diane, through the years, from our amazingly committed and dedicated learning and teaching teams to our incredibly innovative uh, technical teams who are here supporting us even still at this time of day. <laughs> um, and some of our staff have been supporting these programmes for the for the entire period that they've existed over you know so over the last 20 years which I think is, is really amazing we've also had you know fantastic academic staff who've been contributing to these programs down through the years and it's again wonderful that that at least some of you have been able to join us for this celebration this evening I think it's fair to say that the courses have had really strong academic leadership uh, down through the years um you know, uh, people, experts in their field who have who have given that expertise to the programmes and who've really invested in making them the success that they that they continue to be. So working back the way, uh, Ben Alderson Day, Dorothy Cowie, Marco Nardini, Debbie Rivey, all of whom are still in the department. Uh, before our time, as it were, um, David uh, Williams was the programme uh, leader and I think he's at Kent now. Before that, we think it was Vincent Reid, who I believe is now in New Zealand. And before that, <laughs> Professor Sue Lincoln. Um, It's really so fitting that uh, this public lecture for the celebration event is being delivered this evening by Professor Sue Lincoln, not least because she actually founded the programmes. She set these programmes up 20 years ago. Uh, Sue was then at Durham Psychology and she was here between uh, 2000 and 2009 and alongside her, her research programme she initiated uh, these courses in, in 2001 and she was the director for these programmes until she left for Cardiff in, in 2009. She went on to do incredible things in Cardiff because there she founded the Wales Autism Research Centre. Um, uh, the, the work has contributed to the world's first national autism strategy um, through its internationally recognised research uh, impact and assessment. Sue apparently retired in 2019 um, and she's been a, an emeritus professor at Cardiff since then. I say apparently retired because in 2021 she was, an award, she was awarded an emeritus uh, fellowship from the Lever Hume Trust to continue her research on sameness behaviours in children. So it's a really phenomenal pleasure for me to be able to introduce Sue tonight and to have her here to deliver uh, this lecture, not just because she founded the programmes, uh, not just because of her pioneering research um, in autism, um, but because she's a truly wonderful mentor. Uh, she's a fierce champion for early career researchers and you know, if you've worked with Sue, you will know that she works tremendously hard on her work, on her research, but also to support the people that she works with. Um, I think she's one of a kind. So on that note, can you join me in welcoming Professor Sue Newton? Mary? Is there a if Sue uses a microphone? Um, we can try. Use a microphone. Is the sound not great at the back? It's slightly hard to hear. Slightly hard to hear. Let's get a microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> Near blast. So that you can leave that sit on the table if you want. You don't want to just pop it into. 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Great. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Mary, for that lovely introduction um, and for inviting me. And many congratulations um, on the success of nurturing these programs. I know that you and Debbie have been involved in the master's students and master's courses uh, yourselves for nearly a decade. <laughs> so so I, I really congratulate you on nurturing them to their 20th birthday. So, so to celebrate with you, I want to take you back in time 20 years before we had smartphones, um, before we had social media, before we had digital photography and Zoom, to starting up a course, which is still running now. Um, and to tell you a little bit about the origin of the course and how it started. Well, it actually seems to have been born in, a, in an interview that I had with John Findlay, who was the head of department <laughs> 20 years ago. And I convinced him that no problem, I can come and set up a master's course. You know, I really want this job. I haven't set up a new uh, master's course in the, in the next year. And at the time, I th we were aware that we may be able to apply for the ESRC recognition, which would bring lots of students to us. And I wanted to set up a course in developmental psychopathology. And then soon after I arrived and started all the administration for it, which was a complete headache, I uh, discovered that actually we were just not able to set up a master's course in developmental psychopathology and get ESRC recognition. Um, so the, the solution to this problem, which was really aided by a colleague, Robert Druitt, who really was able to magically think of a good way of going forward, was to set up two master's courses, one the MA, one, one the uh, MSE and one the MA, which would be the ESRC route. And the outcome of that actually was way better than we could have ever hoped for because if we had students coming in to the courses, we had just tweaked the structure very slightly. And it meant that everybody came in and did the same, they came in to do the same content, subject content. And it meant that at the during the courses, um, students could choose whether to take a sort of with, uh, a clinical psychology route or, a P or go for a PhD. And many students came and did both. They might have had an idea to do one thing. They decided they got interested in research. They went on the other way. So really, it's worked really well to have these sort of twin courses, um, in fact. So I want to thank everybody that was some of you who are here now, who are so instrumental in getting everything off the ground then. Um, and here is a photo of the very first year of the course. We only had a handful of people. We really struggled to try to find students at the, in that very first year. And amongst them, you'll see Emma Honey. And Emma is now a consultant clinical psychologist. Um, and better still, she's the clinical lead for the Durham and Darlington Neurodevelopmental Assessment Service. And I just can't think of any better outcome for the master's course than to have somebody leading the, the neurodevelopmental assessment course. So it's fantastic, uh, that uh, success. Um, so this is the next year of the course. The, and um, who have we got here? And <laughs> what are they doing now? So, well, we've got Claire Beale, as you can see highlighted at the back here. And Claire is... Uh, a consultant neuropsychologist now and a joint lead for adult neuropsychology pathway in James Cook. And she started with quite a strong neuro, um, neurodevelopmental um, expertise as well. So she's taking that over to neuropsychology. So we're all really pleased about that. Um, and next to Claire, there is Greg Cool. Now, we had a lot of trouble recruiting male students. I don't know whether you still do now, but we only had one for several years and it was Greg. You can see him there because he's poking his tongue out at the back in this photograph. But here he is after three years of PhD um, with Bill Bryson um, under an umbrella, looking very pleased with himself with his PhD. So it's fantastic. Then the following year, we had Kirsten Bland, um, a consultant who's now a consultant clinical psychologist, and she's working in the Parent and Infant Relationship Service and Maternity and Neonatal Psychological Intervention Service. So she's, as she's also done exceptionally well um, with her success as well. And what's really fantastic for us to all see is that she met 
Greg on the last of the course. <laughs> and this is them now in 2022. And they've got two lovely children. So, you know, we've, all sorts of things can happen on the master's course. So that's great. Um, in addition to um, the successes in clinical psychology, we have some foremost um, academic careers that have come through. And here is Holly Joseph, again, in that same year that Kirsten was in, who is now a professor of language and literacy development. Um, and Sue Fletcher Watson, who's also a professor of developmental psychology and director of um, the, the Salveson Mindroom Research Centre, University of Edinburgh. So that is just a selection of the very many successes through the years of the course. Oh, and there's Elizabeth Evans. So I don't know if Elizabeth is, oh, there she is, yeah. And uh, Elizabeth Evans, who uh, is from a later vintage, um, but is associate professor here, your very own, uh, in the Department of Psychology, University of Durham, and sort of come, come home after. <laughs> and so congratulations to all the students. We know how hard the work is. We give you the work so we know how hard it is. <laughs> and um, great achievements, opportunities, and, and development of the courses. So um, to those who are starting out during this term, I don't think I've got master students here yeah. to, to show me. Also. Ah, okay. Well, so as you say, we say it's just very hard, but we have, I, did, I do have, um, a little booklet that other students have prepared in the first years that gives them secrets about how they coped. But we know it was very, it was very hard for them right at the beginning. Um, but I hope you know that you're starting something very special. And we hope that in 20 years, you know, we'll be able to follow your progress too. So, um, so now I want to tell you a research area that I've been interested in for many years. Um, the area of preference for sameness. Now, as many of you know, this subject, which is otherwise called the domain of restricted and repetitive behaviours, or RRBs, is one of the two diagnostic domains for autism, and the other one being social communication. Now, I've been researching autism for about 35 years, and I can attest to the fact that there have been huge changes that we've learned so much from autism um, uh, over the last um, 20 years. Um, and I'm going to say a bit more about that later. But what I want to emphasize first is what we've learned, not only about autism, but from autism. And really what we owe to autism as a subject, our abilities to study it, not only benefit autistic children and adults, but everyone with or without a diagnosis of autism. So. So when we're talking about preference for sameness, I'm talking about human development. And at this point, what I want to say is that it's not just about preference for sameness or restricted and repetitive behaviours, but about the necessity for rep repetition and sameness, which is so much part of early development. And um, we're from infancy, we're drawn into repetition. From birth, we're repeatedly rocking, bouncing, banging, spinning, and these repetitive motor behaviors in the first months of life are absolutely essential for developing neuro, um, for neuromuscular development. Um, repetition and rhythm and rhyme is really important for language development and for cognitive development. Um, and also repetitive practice is the way that we gain mastery uh, throughout our lives. And we're always trying to seek sameness through symmetry and order. And we need that sort of safety and familiarity and sort of comfort from experiencing the same things at the same time um, in the same way uh, each day. Um, so sameness behaviors are adaptive for functioning uh, and for learning and um, for mastery. So the really two sides of the same coin is really about exploring and repetition. Um, it's an equilibrium between the sameness and novelty and between repetition exploration as a sort of ongoing part of children's cognitive and language and emotional development. So this is sort of like the idea of, of, the, of equilibrium. 
And those ideas of equilibrium in learning and development, the idea of consolidation of skills in practice and mastery and support of others in that development um, has been part of theories of developmental psychology really for, for many years, Piaget's theory, Vyotgotsky's theory, and the idea of sensitive periods for motor development um, and for order uh, has also been part of Montessori education as well. Of course, the preference for sameness is built into our religious ri rituals and into sport. So here is a um, piece from Nadal. I repeat the sequence every time before the start of another match at every break until the match is over. First a sip from one bottle and then the other. And after this ritual, then Nadal then arranges his bottles in a certain order. Some would call it superstition, but it's not. If it were superstition, then why would I keep doing the same action whether I win or lose. It's just the way that I set up for the match. I strive to make the outside environment as harmonious as possible with the order that I look for in my mind. So we need order and safety and we need our rituals. We, uncertainty can be hard to deal with when there's an unexpected road. And so it's not surprising that um, these preference for sameness comes along with a dislike of change. So that's the typical way that we involve ourselves with our repetition and order. But what about this diagnostic domain of restricted and repetitive behaviors in autism spectrum disorder? Well, again, I want to take this developmental approach. Uh, and a quote here is I found very helpful, which is repetitive behaviors are often a means to self-regulate emotional states. But in the context of ASD, repetitive behaviors are too often seen as merely symptoms rather than as tools for adaptation. And when, we, when rigid habits and the routines are exhibited, they're generally assumed to be maladaptive. And often they are. But without considering the developmental context, we fail to recognize their normative and possible adaptive functions, just as we see <coughs> typically developing children. That's a quote from Barack. So I want to take you on a story really beginning in Durham when I first arrived. Um, my research interests were really in the area of the social aspects of autism as was the dominant sort of research tradition at the time. Um, but I was interested in sensory aspects of autism. But my real interest uh, in the repetitive behaviors really came um, really from the academic influences that I had when I arrived at Durham um, to the staff here. So all these people were very influential in the work that I did, particularly Michelle Turner, who had written a very important review paper, which is hugely widely cited still today. So it's fantastic to have you here as well, Michelle, today. Um, and then well, with Michelle's influence, we then went on to do way more interesting research on preference for sameness. Um, some examples of some research was the first finding of an association between play and repetitive behaviors in autism with Emma Honey, uh, who was, became our PhD student. Um, with uh, our colleagues in Newcastle and Nakuta and Helen McConaughey, we studied patterns of restricted and repetitive behaviours in two-year-olds, and we also published the RBQ2 questionnaire assessment. Um, developmental change in non-autistic babies from 15 months to six years and association with language and cognition was a um, collaboration that we had with Liz Means and Charles Fernihow um, was a Tears Valley baby study, which was really fruitful in really taking a lot of this work forward. Um, and the, all these studies so far really showed us the ubiquity of repetitive behaviours across the population and also the subtypes, the different types of repetitive behaviour that we see. Um, Anxiety and repetitive behaviours became a really strong interest for this group. But it, and we joined with, there was um, 
Nat Freeston and Jackie Rogers, uh, who then started to work with a number of us to look um, at intolerance of uncertainty and anxiety. So the work of Sarah Lang, um, who is another MSc student, um, who worked with Charles Fernihale, Michelle and Mark. So we want to say thank you for the, all the master students. If you're, any of you are still on there on the Zoom and watching then, uh, and those who are here tonight, um, thank you for your, all of your um, work that, that led this, um, these important pieces of work. So in 2010, I was I'd arrived at Cardiff. Um, so for the next decade, we continued with the Northeast Springboard for research on, in preference for sameness. Um, and did a lot of other work, which was published during that time. Um, we had some work on the stability of different subtypes of uh, repetitive behaviours. Um, the work, some research on the relation to language and cognition. And from the autism side, once we were doing research on autism, we looked at the relations amongst re restricted and repetitive behaviours, anxiety and sensory features, and the interplay between um, sensory processing abnormalities and intolerance of uncertainty. And the group from Newcastle here um, have taken this work forward in a really important way to um, study um, intolerance of uncertainty, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Then a, a nice study that was done by Caroline Joyce from Newcastle also brought together uh, a number of us to look at an anxiety, intolerance, uncertainty, and restricted repetitive behaviors. And this time using insights directly from adolescents about their own experiences of having of, of repetitive um, and behaviors. I'll talk about that later as well. Again, thank you to the, the students. So after I'd arrived uh, in Durham, we were obviously busy publishing papers, but the um, Evidence base uh, in this area and this part of autism was still quite scarce, particularly compared to the social communication part. And so in 2011, with my colleagues Margot Pryor and Mirko Ozharovic, who's here, um, we wrote a, a review paper um, of, you know, trying to make some recommendations. That's 10 years after Michelle's um, landmark paper um, in 1999. And um, we've just completed another one, um, following up again for further re uh, recommendations for another decade, um, which has been completed and it's under review at the moment. So with all this work going on, um, what have we learned over 20 years? Our progress in research is never as great as it is in technology, Elaine. <laughs> it's always uh, going much slower, I'm afraid. But we do have a bit to say about um, the how to describe, how to explain, and how to support um, preference for sameness. And I'll say a little bit about each of those. So first of all, how to describe repetitive behaviours. That's where most of the effort of research has gone. So if we look back 80 years or 70, 80 years to Kanner's original case notes, um, still very much relevant today, he spun with great pleasure anything he could seize upon to spin jumped up and down repeatedly, arranged beads, sticks, or blocks in groups of different series or colors. Most actions were repetitions carried in exactly the same way in which they'd been performed originally. And the dread of change and incompleteness seems to be a major factor in the explanation of the monotonous repetitiousness and the resulting limitations in the variety of spontaneous activity, which captures, I think, quite a lot in that one quote. But really to describe repetitive behaviours, you need an awful lot of items. It's a very, very broad um, subject with many different items, the very different um, behaviours that you can see under a sort of umbrella. Um, and some of the work that's being done is really looking at the classification of all these different types of behaviours to see what it is that relates to what, how they group together, how one set of behaviours groups to another set of behaviours. Um, looking at the diagnosis of autism, these are also grouped into subtypes. So we've got motor behaviours, sensory behaviours, routines and rituals and interests. And for each, I've got examples of those behaviours. But as you just saw, there are just so many different behaviours um, that these are just examples of the kinds of behaviours that you'll see 
um, under those subtypes. Now, a couple of things to note here, and that is that for a diagnosis, um, the criteria don't re criteria don't require that you have an example of every single subtype here for a DSM-5 diagnosis. You actually only need one item, one particular example from two of these, which doesn't make for very many. It, in fact, as it turns out, most autistic uh, individuals do have many repetitive and restrictive behaviours, but this can account for the fact that the profiles of different individuals um, may be very different because they don't necessarily have all of these different um, subtypes. The other thing here to just flag up is that symptoms need to present in early development and the clinical significant severity is required to support, needs, requires support due to distress or difficulty. So we are looking at something which is intense and that does need support for the diagnosis. So those DSM-5 subcategories, because um, the DSM-5 is a committee um, consensus for deciding about the criteria. And in order to be able to develop conceptualization of, auto, of, the, of the items of the sensory of, of, um, and motor um, and routines and restricted interests, we need to be able to do more empirical work to see which of the items sort of connect with other items so that we know that we're really focusing on the ones which really um, are going to go together. And the factor analysis studies, the number of factor analysis studies were done in the first decade, uh, and they tended to group the behaviours into two main types, repetitive sensory and motor behaviour and insistence on sameness. Um, and in the 2011 review that we did, um, we found that it was nine studies, we only found nine studies altogether that had been done, um, and six of them had uh, two, these two factors RSMB and IS, although there were some groups like Emma Honey's group who had found evidence for more than um, two factors. Um, but then in our 2022 review paper, there are many, many more um, studies that have been done. They found 37 factor analysis studies. And now we get far more studies where CI, circumscribed interests, uh, appear as being a separate group of um, behaviours. Um, so the next question I want to ask here is about how distinct repetitive behaviours are. And I've already convinced you about the universality of repetitive behaviours in the first part of the lecture. And you can see here that repetitive behaviours, of course, are found in typical development. And all of the behaviours you see, you also see in typical development. So the difference between autism and normative development really relates to the frequency and severity rather than the form or the pattern. Um, and this difference, a new paper just came out um, this year showing that e even in the first three years of life, that difference in the frequency and severity actually is noticeable and significant and can be seen very early, even though infants show huge numbers of repetitive behaviours, um, even if they not, do not go on to have um, autism. Repetitive behaviours are also found across a wide range of neurodevelopmental conditions and more studies now, um, those are the two review studies at the bottom there, which you know, have increased in their numbers to show repetitive behaviours. And on the, these genetic syndromes, many of them are associated with intellectual disability and intellectual disability is also associated with more repetitive behaviours as well. And then increasingly, there are now more psychiatric conditions um, that are also uh, neurodevelopmental conditions that have also been shown um, with uh, as having insistence on sameness as well. So just to summarise on this describing repetitive behaviours, we've got a complex range of behaviours, best classified as two main subtypes, but there's another subtype which is sort of pushing through as being important as well. Um, repetitive behaviours are not distinctive to autism, though they are more frequent and intense, um, and the level of intellectual disability and also the level of fear and distress are also important factors. So how to explain repetitive behaviours? Now let's just, I just want to move quickly to the theories and mechanisms and give, to start with, just a very brief overview of theories that seem to be that have become probably the most foremost series in the last 10 years or so. Um, the executive function theory, which has actually been going for 20 years more rather than 10 years, um, which um, 
really that that theory um, originally um, re- explained repetitive behaviours really due to a top-down cognitive control impairment um, with different components, um, potentially as candidates, cognitive inhibition, generativity, planning, shifting, working memory, so a number of different components. The developmental systems um, approach following Esther Thielen um, su- suggested t- suggest two mechanisms, but twin work mechanisms, uh, arousal and regu- regulation that would kind of work in tandem with each other. The intolerance of uncertainty approach is approach which sort of focuses on anxiety, um, the anxiety aspect of in preference for sameness, with two um, components in it relating to desire for pr- predictability and uncertainty paralysis, either of which might be affected. And then finally, the attention allocation approach or monotropism, which is um, a theory um, that's been put forward of um, attention tunnel. So this idea of being very over-focused on attention with another concept of flow, which is an absorption into um, the attention while you have it and the difficulty of dragging yourself away from that. So just a bit about what the evidence is for those theories. Well, um, when Michelle wrote her um, paper, uh, the proposal at that time was that there may be different components of executive functions um, that might explain preference for sameness. But across a decade or so, no consistent evidence was found for any general explanation. And in retrospect, that's not surprising because actually what we've got here is two sort of umbrella constructs with many components in each of them. Um, But then interestingly, in the last year, there's been a revival of this approach um, of executive functioning with some new evidence in support of the executive functioning view. Um, And this mostly relates to cognitive shifting and the use of an executive functioning questionnaire measure. So if you use a questionnaire measure, then you tend to find these effects, but mostly in relation to cognitive shifting. Now, the developmental systems approach has had far less empirical done um, on it. And again, it's not a theory of autism, it's a theory of development. Uh, But the predictions that from it are that developmental changes in repetitive behaviours correspond to development of self-regulated behaviour at the end of infancy, and that repetitive behaviours remain um, in the behavioural repertoire, even when you're older than that, but they're triggered when there's an imbalance in the sensory or emotional arousal state. And in terms of the evidence for this, um, we find different developmental trajectories. So if we look at the repetitive um, behaviours that we see in the Tease Valley Baby Study, we see there's a a clear drop um, in in age uh, in typically developing children. And in the big data approach that's been used to look at um, autism, um, very many studies of autism find a similar um, trajectory of reduction, but with children are older, so they're five, to 15 rather than two when that starts to happen. But really importantly is it relates to cognitive function um, and the cognitive uh, function is delayed um, and lower than the dissociation um, comes much later. If we look at insistence on sameness, um, we see um, there's a different trajectory here where the repetitive, where you tend to see a rise um, after the age of two. Um, And again, in the autism literature, you see a similar trend, but again, happening much later um, than in autism and in um, the typically developing children. So um, evidence from our group also showed how in young children, high levels of repetitive sensory motor behaviours in two-year-olds were related to lower language and cognitive scores when children were four to five years old. But they didn't find, we didn't find any relations for insistence on sameness behaviours. And this might be because insistence on sameness behaviours don't really start to get off the ground until after two years old. So we've been recently looking at some new data, some of the, well, some of the data from the six-year cohort of the Cheese Valley Baby Study, which is also showing a rather similar trend in that the insistence on sameness doesn't show such a strong relation as repetitive motor behaviours, even at six. Um, So if we um, now move to thinking about insistence on sameness in relation to anxiety. So first of all, one of our first, the first prediction for the developmental approach was it would be related to 
um, self-regulation behavior, which may start to come into place after two years old. But the second prediction was that insistence on that the behaviors, uh, the, uh, the emotion and um, arousal may be particular, may continue um, even when children are older. Uh, and we do find that insistence on sameness behaviors are related to anxiety. So in this first study, anxiety was associated with insistence on sameness with autistic children, again from a, another master's student, Jane Lidstone. Um, and sensory features, though, seem to relate to and influence this link between insistence on sameness and anxiety. And in another study, we find these, again, these links between anxiety, um, insistence on sameness, and cognitive control. So each seem to be related to the other. Um, and that's those links um, we still need to know more about, but they are relevant to the way that insistence on sameness behaviors in particular, they show themselves. So another account now is the intolerance uncertainty account, and that really takes anxiety as the main focus. Um, and the idea is that intolerance for uncertainty um, has these different aspects to them. A decreased threshold for perception of ambiguity, comfort with ambiguity, and a tendency to react negatively to uncertain situations and events. So we know from quite a lot of research now that fears and anxiety are associated with insistence on sameness in autism, but they're also related to a separate construct, one of intolerance of uncertainty. Um, and this is in children and adolescents and adults. And quite an important um, model has been produced, which is still in the process of being tested, which is looking at these different components that feed into intolerance of uncertainty, including atypical sensory function, emotional awareness, and rigidity of thought. Intolerance of uncertainty is then related to restricted and repetitive thoughts and behaviors, and also to anxiety symptoms with a really interesting bi-directional link here in which that you would may want to use restricted and repetitive behaviors to drive down your anxiety symptoms, but the restrictedness of the behaviors might lead to further anxiety. Um, so finally now, the attention allocation approach, which addresses the domains of unusual interests and sensory responses. And that proposes that there are autistic differences in attention or enhanced perception. And this theory was actually put forward in 2005, but it hasn't had hardly any uh, research uh, evidence linked to it. Um, but there are implications for new research on attention allocation, um, particularly when there's a challenge between competing information processing demands and um, on focused interests. And so um, we ourselves with our group um, are looking at um, a study which is relevant to monotropism, um, which the, the PI is Kirsten Abbott-Smith um, at the University of Kent. And um, the research is being done um, at Sheffield and Cardiff University. And it's called the Cognitive Constraints on Children's Ability to Manage a uh, Conversational Topic. So what we're looking at is the effect of com cognitive load um, and conversation topic. Um, and children are for, in this experimental study are involved in a conversation and then they're, going, they're seeing a distracted image, either no image at all, a low interest image or a high interest image. And the prediction would be that autistic children would show a greater cost of the image interest um, in maintaining the topic, even if the stimuli themselves are similar brightness in, in, the, in the stimuli. So I wanted to flag up that there's a PhD studentship that will be linked with this project. And so if there are any current master students who are interested, um, just contact, uh, um, contact Kirsten and, um, and um, to follow up. And there's another research assistant post going as well. So um, I want to flag that one up. So what have we learned from theories over the last 20 years? Well, it's interesting that these different explanations seem to converge on rather similar um, psychological mechanisms. Um, that, that's about arousal, flexibility cognitively and emotionally, and perception of uncertainty, or in this other most recent one, um, on high focus of attention. 
Um, so it would be a really good thing for the next decade if some of this, um, some of these different mechanisms that have been proposed, we could have some sort of conceptual development and further integration of that work. Um, and when we do consider uh, any of these theories and do any of the uh, do any of the research with it, we often do find that subdomains show different effects. So it's important to be um, aware of that. And also the developmental periods uh, are also really an important factor um, to bear in mind. So now uh, on to support, um, when, how, and what types of support. So the first question really related to that is why intervene um, on repetitive behaviors? So, so 20 years ago, um, it was much more the norm to use um, behavior modification techniques to try to reduce repetitive behaviors. And there wasn't really the view as there is today that they are can actually be so helpful and adaptive. But a really important study and paper came out from autistic adults arguing that it's really important for repetitive behaviors to be understood in terms of their value, particularly the value of stimming um, and other repetitive behaviors as well. And the perspectives of autistic adults, um, uh, sorry, adolescents were studied by this study by um, Caroline Joyce that some, some of us here were involved in. Um, and Caroline identified both triggers and functions by asking people about their own meanings, what it meant for them to have repetitive behaviors. Really nice study because it involved um, a qualitative aspect, but also used the repetitive behavior questionnaire as a more quantitative aspect in there as well. So these are what were identified there were um, the main triggers being arousal, both under stimulation and overstimulation, and the function of repetitive behaviors really being um, depending on whether your arousal was understimulated or overstimulated. So you might use repetitive behaviors to increase arousal, to increase attention, or to concentrate on tasks, or to reduce arousal and to relieve tension or stress, um, or to shift a focus of emotion and pain, reduce anxiety or reduce uncertainty, and familiarity, safety, and comfort also being very important. Um, so that's the meanings um, of, uh, of repetitive behaviors for autistic people tell us that repetitive behaviors do have this very important positive value. So they can be helpful and adaptive, but when they are very intense, rep some repetitive behaviors can also be the source of stress. Um, they can be, create risk for health or for learning or to safety. Um, so it's important for each individual to tailor the support needs. So what we'd be suggesting here was to assess their subtype profile. What type of repetitive behaviors are they that um, are creating um, some challenges? Um, and what are the triggers and functions? And to consider the arousal level, because that does seem to be a really important mechanism. And self-regulation, not just the sex self-regulation, but what self-regulation resources that individual might have. Think about whether repetitive behaviors are associated with an actual risk for the individual. And if there isn't a risk, then it may be helpful for them to continue to use their repetitive behaviors. But if there is, then work with the individual, parents and teachers, to try to understand first what the individual's preferences are within their developmental context. Try to remember that what repetitive behaviors are being shown will probably relate to the developmental level of that particular individual. And adapt the environmental context um, to try to reduce some of the sensory loads for the individual. Um, <laughs> use, their, use the interests of the individual to help develop their skills and give opportunity for extending the adaptive repertoire. So opportunities for choosing an alternative um, where possible. Also engaging in social engagement and social synchrony because there is some work that shows that repetitive behaviors are reduced when it is the um, 
uh, in, in, in communi- the PACT communication trial, um, uh, in, in engagement with uh, early, early social engagement is very important for, seems to be relevant to later outcomes for repetitive behavior. Um, and then so there are some various support programs, particularly in the Northeast, which are now developing very important ways of supporting um, people with, or, with autism, with their repetitive behaviors. Um, there was very, very little many years ago. There still is very, very little out there that's tailored to repetitive behaviors, not just general sort of supports. Um, and this program, the Cues program, um, is being run by, by Jackie Rogers. There's a program, um, an NIH, NIHR program that's been developed at uh, Newcastle University Managing Repetitive Behaviors. And of course, there's a triple A at Durham, which is all I'm talking about is all about arousal uh, and attention and anxiety. So this is all very relevant in the mainstream schools. So this really is a schematic of um, where we are with what we've learned. Um, we know a lot more about how to describe. We know a lot less about how to explain and how to support. So still plenty of work there for the next generation of researchers um, to, you know, to, to go forward. We really do need that work to be done in this area. But what I wanted to conclude with really is to just open the perspective, open the lens a little bit more to look at not just this area on preference for sameness, but to look at changing times for autism research altogether, just looking at autism. And there has been an almost transformation um, of the research culture, uh, which Mary was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, and I want to just remind you that up until the 2010s, we had all of this, very little science communication we're working for medical expertise model, a scientist-driven research questions rather than co-participation, very little integration of knowledge between academic and clinical approaches, and very little participatory research. And one of the people who's spearheading this new work is one of our former master's students, um, Professor Sue Fletcher Watson, who um, has a led on this piece of work, making the future together, shaping autism research through meaningful participation. And I was really very pleased to be involved in that series of seminars, which sort of set up that work. And that's really been moving fast and changing the culture um, in these ways that are identified in these, this paper. So change of culture, change of ways that we're working with co-participation and meaningful co-participation at that. Um, and so we don't just stop at culture. We're now also, there's also great moves happening and changes happening in concepts and theories. And a little reminder again of development and disabilities before the, before the 2000s. So there's a developmental approach um, was really there from the middle of the last century, uh, including the constructivist frameworks, Piaget, um, social cultural framework of Vygotsky, and then the newer developmental psychopathology approach, which was trying to bring together clinical and developmental psychology um, in the 1980s and 90s. And those approaches really supported the ideas of knowledge being constructed via experience, the child being supported by others and by context, and development as a system, a process organized, adapted, and integrated. So very different sets of ideas from those that were really quite dominant just about the time I came to Durham or just before, which is more this cognitive modularity approach, which held sway in the 80s and 90s. Um, of, a, of a, um, a medical model framework, which was it was supporting towards neurodevelopmental disorders and um, and medical and psychiatric conditions, with well, the idea of a fixed underlying deficit, either having impairments, either having impairments or else intact abilities, specialization of cognitive function, and very distinct categories of impairment. Now, this approach, although now it's way in the past, in fact, for neurodevelopmental uh, conditions, it's actually been a bit difficult to shake off in some ways. And I think that's particularly because of the fact that the DSM-5, the medical model framework, also supports diagnosis, which also is very 
distinct in terms of the categories of impairment that you either have autism or you don't have autism and so on. Um, but now things are moving and things are really changing. So changing concepts of autism that we see now is that we used to talk about um, discrete abilities. We're now moving into a new view of dimensions and talking about uh, a spectrum of autism. Instead of thinking about singular um, impairments, we're now thinking that there's overlapping conditions and co-occurring multiple conditions that um, can exist. Rather than a deficit, we're now focusing more on the variation in individuals and the difference and the concept of neurodiversity. And rather focusing on specificity um, as being the main thing that we're looking for, we're going to isolate this specific biomarker. We now know that we need to perhaps look sometimes at more general processes and move towards a transdiagnostic approach. So changing times of changing approaches to research and a whole new transformative agenda of neurodiversity and transdiagnostic um, approaches. Again, Sir Fletcher Watson is involved in a lot of this work um, and has written a very good paper on transdiagnostic research and neurodiversity paradigm. Um, so um, we're grateful for all our master's students and all of the work that they've brought to this whole field and in transforming it. And um, I want to say to the current master's students or any future students that are still making their way to their career that the future is yours. Um, so it's time for celebrations of the 20 years of this course and to bring on lighting the fireworks. <laughs>